Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to all 233 of you. Uh, 800 of you are registered, and I'm sure you'll come along uh, as, as, the, uh, as our webinar continues. Um, I'd like to say uh, good afternoon to all of you, uh, our insiders who have joined us, and our very special guests, uh, Pallad Jordan and Matt Maharaj, authors of uh, uh, this fantastic book, Breakthrough. Um, we'll be talking to the two stalwarts today. Um, well, you know, the, the biogs are on the, uh, on the advertisement today, so I'm not going to go into too long. We both know these are, are both ANC veterans who are deeply and consistently involved in shaping the democratic future of South Africa. This book actually is about the nuts and bolts, about the moving parts that led to the negotiated settlement that resulted in this country's first democratic elections. But there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So with an intimate knowledge of the, of the process, I'd like to just begin by quoting Judge Dennis Davis's little um, introduction in the in the forward. It, it was sort of placed for all of you where the book uh, currently finds itself. Uh, he writes, a sustained analysis by key ANC figures in the move towards constitutional democracy has not been available until the authors of this work, Mac Maharaj and Palo Jordan, set pen to paper. Both have much to offer in search of answers. They didn't simply sit in the grandstand observing proceedings. They were on the field of play, buttressed by the struggle of millions who bore the brunt of an inhumane system, seeking with their comrades to replace an racist, authoritarian, non-racial democracy. This book crisply and incisively documents the often slow, but nevertheless inexorable process which the ANC, in which the ANC gained the upper hand in its bitter contest with the National Party. With no more room for manoeuvre other than to enter negotiations with the very organisation that it had sought to destroy over a period of time, more than 40 years, the apartheid regime had buckled. Uh, that is uh, Dennis Davis's introduction to the book. Um, but we cannot cover in one hour uh, everything and all the detail that's in this book. The first part of the book looks at the context and history of, of the trade union movement, how that began, mass democratic movements, the ANC, and various other parts of history that are relatively well documented. But you will gain other insights from both Palo and Mac's um, uh, perspective. But I'd like to, it also debunks many myths about the history of the ANC uh, and MK. Often the, uh, the narrative is that the ANC was useless, authoritarian, it didn't negotiate or, or liaise with people inside the country, MK didn't accomplish much. Several books have been written about the period, uh, Neil Barnard, for example, who was part of the, you know, the government's negotiating team, sort of self-praising books, uh, Prisoner 913, Billy Esterhazer has written a few, Mac Maharaj, there have been many books, which, you know, but we haven't had a full account from those who were inside uh, the movement. All right, welcome the two of you. I'm going to sort of start our conversation a bit later on about from chapter eight onwards, if, you, if, we, if we can maybe focus our heads there. But let's begin. I'm not sure who would like to answer this one. Who, uh, why now? Why this book? Why now? And why have the two of you who've been out of the public view for some time um, made yourselves sort of open to be part of the new discussion around our past and, and where that took us? Not sure who wants to answer. Well, um, Mac and I have been working on uh, another project. Uh, in fact, um, I suppose one or two projects. And um, that wasn't going very far owing to a number of uh, external causes. When uh, the um, pandemic hit the country, uh, we decided to slightly change game and look at this dimension. Uh, it would have been, in our original thinking, probably the last chapter in the project we were jointly working on, um, looking at um, the developments that led up to the Khutasti uh, meeting. Um, it's an attempt, I think, to um, assemble in a one place uh, all the relevant facts uh, and present them in a um, readable uh, but also um, yeah in a manner that um, in a sense draws the threads together uh, of uh, the various strands 
uh, yeah, that uh, converged uh, in 1919. The moment was chosen for us, in a sense, uh, but the need for the book, I think, uh, was uh, very keenly felt. Perhaps I could just add one thing, uh, Marianne. My, as we went on working and researching, I must say I personally became intrigued uh, by not what happened at the table once we met at the multi-party negotiations, but how parties in a conflict reached that table became an intriguing question for me. And I think most studies of conflicts and wars focus on what happens at the table. And yet it is that issue of how they get to the table and how the forces play out rather than just a story of a great of great individuals doing it all. I, I think that the forces that were at play became the intriguing question for me. And we know that the Nats had said from 48 that they would never sit down and talk with the ANC. And yet there they were at Futuskir in May 1990. And so that question of what happens and how the parties get there is I think an issue that worth studying in the South African case because it is well documented now. And what we did was in this book was to put all the facts that we could find that are relevant. If we have left out any facts, we would welcome people coming to us and telling us you've left this fact out. And we must be clear, facts, not assumptions. And if we have put facts that are irrelevant to the problem, we'd welcome that to be also there in the discussion. I think it's important for people to bear in mind that Palo is, you know, one of the great thinkers in the ANC uh, and, and, and was responsible for several policy documents and, and papers, discussion papers. That's the other thing you, that's quite clear in the book is that the ANC uh, internally uh, and, and everywhere else is was a democratic uh, movement attempting to address and talk through many perspectives of where to go. And yourself, uh, Matt, you know, involved in Operation Vula later on. So just so people know the closeness of the two of you uh, to these events, you're speaking about the nuts and bolts. I think because we're going to start from chapter eight, but we had a very interesting little conversation in the waiting room, which I'd like perhaps both of you to elaborate on. And Paolo, that is so interesting. I mentioned that I had heard for the first time at a a discussion at the, strange enough, F.W. De Klerk Foundation, when L.B. Sachs mentioned how Oliver Tambo and others, or the ANC, had become aware that we, that some sort of Bill of Rights needed to be constructed uh, in, 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 with the foresight that some sort of constitution was going to happen. But, Pella, you that, that was sort of um, uh, long, long before that. Pella, you mentioned that the ANC had come up uh, with a document, a Bill of Rights. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. It was 1945, I think you said. Uh, tell us a bit about that one, and then we can move into the various uh, happenings around uh, the Mandela document, the Mel's Park discussions, the engagements. But tell us a bit about the that 1945 uh, discussion document, and then also uh, the committee, uh, which included yourself, Albi Sachs, Jack Simons, and a few others. And, and Mac, you can also just fill in where you need to. Well, the first Bill of Rights that the ANC drafted was in 1925, and it was called the African Bill of Rights. Uh, it was a rather conservative document. I think uh, didn't exceed five major points. Uh, the principle uh, which the ANC has always advocated was the principle of government by the, con by the consent of the government. I mean, that was central to that document. Uh, the next major document, uh, I would say, was the African's claims. Now, the origins of the African's claims is um, <coughs> the um, Atlantic Charter, uh, which was agreed upon by Churchill and Roosevelt in 1941. Then president of the ANC, Dr. A.B. Kuma, they put together a committee and he said they should study the Atlantic Charter and see how it, it can be applied to the African continent. Uh, the African's claims was uh, the product of that committee. The African's claims uh, has been described in some respects as somewhat precocious uh, because it precedes the UN Declaration of Human Rights and it also precedes many of the uh, ideas that are now accepted in terms of uh, protection of the environment, etc. Uh, the green rights uh, that people talk about these days, 
you'll find that in the African slaves. Uh, then uh, I suppose the Freedom Charter is the next big step. Uh, I think I just, Maggie, uh, Paolo, just to interrupt you, I think I think you said John Stiernazen would have been very happy with that early document. Just uh, as, you know, we can make that uh, reference now. Why why would they have been happy with that very early 1925 document? They should have gone. Hey, no, no, no. I was joking when I said that uh, because it's, it's it's very conservative, uh, and uh, it only talks about you know the political rights. It doesn't talk about. Uh, you know, uh, the rights that we now take for granted, uh, like, you know, uh, I suppose the social rights that one can talk about, you see, for instance, uh, there's no reference to uh, the right to unionize, for example, no reference to the issue of land. Uh, well, there is a reference to the issue of land, but in a very, very conservative way, it just says uh, everyone should have the right to buy Buy and, sell, buy and sell land anywhere in the country. In other words, it doesn't challenge uh, what we had inherited as a result of the Native Land Act and other uh, acts of dispossession in the past. So it was very conservative in that way, but it was insistent, and that is the important thing, on the principle of government by the consent of the government. And that was central. I think uh, that's the red thread that runs through all ANC thinking, uh, up to and including the constitution we negotiated. Are we still there? Well, we you seem to have lost Marianne. <laughs> well, maybe we should continue on our own. <laughs> Hi, Marianne, can you hear us? I'm terribly oh. sorry. I think they cut me off at Orania. I'm in Orania. <laughs> I'm Orania. It must have been that reference to the land that freaked them out. I think it was. I'm terribly <laughs> sorry. We're all back. I hope you kept chatting. Okay, so uh, I'm back on. I've thwarted them. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so we have this 1925 document. Um, um, so the foresight is already there in a sense that, that some sort of constitution needs to be looked at for, for the future. Um, let's move then, I suppose, to, to chapter eight of the book, where in a sense then the ANC is slightly ahead already uh, of the national government in, in looking towards uh, what's going to happen. So after the Kumati Accord, um, which was 1985, the ANC then has the Kabwe conference in 1986. What uh, what happened with the Nkumati Accord that led to the decision to have this Kabwe conference and then discuss further uh, the Bill of Rights and what that mattered? There's something quite significant happened there, which led the ANC to begin looking in that in that direction. No, I think you've got uh, the date slightly wrong. Uh, uh, Komati was uh, 1983. 1983. And, and uh, the uh, yeah, uh, Kabwe Conference was 1984. Mm -hmm. 84. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Kabwe Conference was 1985. Uh, the two are not linked in that sense causally, but of course they are linked temporarily. Uh, in the context of uh, the Komati Accord, uh, one of the things that uh, arose uh, in our discussions with the, with the African states uh, was the issue of, uh, well, what's the way forward? And uh, it was in that context that, uh, you know, the ANC then set up a number of committees uh, to look at a whole range of issues, uh, including the issue of uh, negotiations. Um, Kabwe uh was uh, a response to the upsurge uh in the country and internationally uh, which uh, the anc in many respects had marshaled uh by the time we met at kabwe uh, one can say that uh, yeah the country um had become ungovernable uh, the attempt by the Bhutta regime to impose a tricameral parliament uh, had caused that uprising in 84, 
which had spread 85 and the country was in flames in a sense. Uh, that was one aspect of it. The other dimension of it, of course, was the international. Uh, we, at that point, uh, we had, uh, I think, uh, so mobilized international community that uh, the racist regime was filling the pinch. Uh, it was uh, increasingly isolated internationally. And uh, except for the Reagan administration, the United States, and the Thatcher administration in the UK, who insisted on quote unquote constructive engagement. Uh, yeah, the, the racist regime was very much isolated at that point. Uh, in terms of uh, what the ANC itself had achieved organizationally, it had reconstructed its own underground inside the country and uh, was now an effective force. And it was clear that uh, most of the of those who were in earnest about bringing about change were looking more and more towards the ANC. And one could say that uh, the thrust for democracy was converging around the banners of the ANC. So I would say that was the context of the Cowboy Conference. And um, its significance is that uh, uh, it was seen very much as a council of war. Uh, if I uh, remember one of the banners at the conference said, from the conference to the battlefield, was, was to that effect. Am I right back or is that my imagination? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but that was sort of the mood that uh, from here uh, onward to victory. Well, you must bear in mind that two days before Cabo, there was an SADF raid into Botswana in which 12 people were killed, two houses destroyed. And there is an interesting thing because just the other day I was having a chat with a leading academic and he told me that uh, he believed that at Kabwe a decision was taken to negotiate with the regime and that it is people like myself and others who defied that decision and wanted to march into Pretoria in tanks. Uh, this is one more, one more mythology about our, background, our story, uh, whereas the facts are very clear that Kabwe was taking place at a time when there was an upsurge inside the country at a mass level. There was a movement within ex externally to isolate and impose sanctions. And P.W. Botha and his regime had begun to trip themselves over in trying to maneuver in this space. So that is the context. But the important point to realize here is that post Nkomati, there was a talk from various heads of states in Africa to say that maybe it's time also, like Mozambique, to negotiate with Pretoria. There was also this type of pressure and word coming from Western power. And the Tambo at that stage turned to Palo and said, Palo, can you study what is happening at home in terms of the models that are emerging within the uh, regime circles? There was the Butelezi Commission, the tricamp parliament ideas were coming up. And that study by Palo ended up with a proposal to say, whilst negotiations are not feasible at this stage because the regime is not at all serious about negotiations, it would be important for the ANC to ensure that it was also always holding the strategic initiative. And for that, he made two proposals in it. One, that the ANC should come out in support of a multi-party democracy, and secondly, that it should look at fundamental rights as being part of its position. Those two positions were articulated in the January 8th statement of 1987. That's right. And, and the proposal emanated in two things. The setting up of a constitutional committee, which began functioning in January 86, headed by Professor Simons, and secondly, the positions being taken in the January 8th statements so that the proposal by Paulo was that if we put the two stakes on the ground, everybody else debating the issue of the future of South Africa would have to react to the ANC proposals and therefore the initiative would be the HT hands. I think it is important to recognize that moment in all struggles that the, the liberation struggle had to take the initiative and become 
that not just in words but by the state positions it took. So Kabwe was prosecute the struggle, intensify it, and make sure that whatever happens, we are pursuing the goal of a democracy in South Africa. And one based on, on then the, the, uh, the constitutional guidelines um, are drawn up around 1988 at this point, I think, from the ANC's point of view. And what's important here for those listening in or watching is that what you can see in the book is that um, the National Party government, uh, in an attempt to try and find, as, as Talo and both Maka said, these ways of, 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 of refashioning apartheid in different forms, uh, was so busy and caught up with that um that they actually i don't think had a sense of what the anc was busy with while the anc's thinkers and policymakers had seen far ahead into the future so it's important for people to remember that this these constitutional guidelines were drawn up already in 1988 by the anc and they bring these to the negotiations eventually but then there's the harari declaration of 1989 so just tell us a bit about the significance of the harari declaration uh, and, and what that led into. And then we'll talk a bit about how the government tries to find um, fractures in the ANC itself, because it doesn't quite understand the organization. It arrogantly thinks it does. It has Nelson Mandela in captivity, listening to him, you know, every phone call, every cell. But let's talk about the Harari Declaration and then what the National Party sets out to do, thinking it's going to lead this process uh, and, and corner the ANC. Um, if you could just perhaps tell us a little bit about that. Hello. Yeah. Oh, you go. <laughs> Come, Palo. Oh, look, I mean, we don't have to get stuck there in a sense because okay. at this point, no, we're yeah. also dealing All right. with water. Let, 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 yeah. yeah. let me come in on that. Uh, the declaration uh, is uh, very much the product of uh, Oliver Tambo's uh, genius and also his energy. Um, when it became clear that, uh, you know, uh, we were on the road to, uh, yeah, we were on the road to victory, uh, Oliver Tambo took the initiative to uh, win the support of uh, first the uh, then OAU, and then the international community uh, around uh, a declaration uh, which would set out, in a sense, what the bottom line was in terms of uh, the way forward for South Africa. Uh, the Harari Declaration was conceived, uh, if you remember, maybe you don't, but in the case of uh, Zimbabwe, uh, there had been the formula internationally accepted uh, of no independence before majority rule. Uh, you had, in the case of Namibia, uh, a number of uh, UN General Assembly resolutions uh, around uh, you know, what the state of uh, the future should be, etc. And uh, the idea was we should have a similar document. Uh, about South Africa, the national uh, document and declaration on the future of South Africa. And that's how the Arari Declaration was uh, conceived. Uh, having drafted it, President Kawunda of Zambia put at uh, Tambo's disposal uh, a jet, a private jet, uh, which uh, he used to travel to uh, Botswana to Angola, to Mozambique, to Tanzania, and Zimbabwe, uh, to first of all get the, a consensus around uh, this position amongst what were referred to as the frontline states. And it was the frontline states who then took that declaration to a special committee of the Organization of African Unity, which met first in uh, Lusaka. Uh, where the finishing touches were put to it, and then finally was adopted in Harare. The irony of uh, that, a sad irony in a way, is that on the very eve 
of the meeting in Lusaka when the finishing touches were put to the Harari Declaration, Oliver Tambo came down with a stroke and was unable to participate in that meeting himself. But uh, he had attained, I think, one of his most important objectives at that point, which was to get consensus around this issue on the part of the OAU. Uh, the Harari Declaration then became the basis. Well, that was then taken by the OAU to the United Nations. And there was a UN General Assembly resolution also based on the Harari Declaration the following year. So that we then had the basis on which uh, negotiations could begin. And uh, yeah, what the Harari Declaration set out very clearly is that whatever negotiations take place should be about the dismantling of a party, not about massaging it this way or moving the chairs on the deck or anything like that. It should be about the dismantling at the end of a party. If I may, if I may come in there just to take the point a bit further, I think it is important to realize that there was a, a, a battle of positions taking place in relation to how we end up in a negotiation. And we have various documents that the ANC developed over time as the events began to unfold. What became clear is that by the time we reached Futuskir in 1990, the ANC has crafted its positions. They are constituted, one, by the letter that Mandela wrote, uh, drafted for to, Mandela, to P.W. Botha in 89 April, in which he said that there should be negotiations with the ANC and between the ANC and the regime. And those that negotiation would have to find a way to attend to two problems. On one side, the principle of majority rule, and on the other side, the fears and concerns of the white minority who wanted guarantees that they will not be subjected to black domination. He said that would be the heart of the problem. The ANC, in the meantime, also in its January 8th statement, had articulated a position where it was now in favor of a Bill of Rights and of a multi-party democracy. The Constitutional Committee develops, in the meantime, the constitutional guidelines which were presented, and I must emphasize, presented for discussion within South Africa and abroad, so that it were input. It were guidelines. It was not prescribing a solution. It was putting on the table the necessity for everybody to come on board with their ideas and discuss. That's the constitutional guidelines. So these three documents become sort of setting up the parameters. And the Harare Declaration endorsed by the OAU and, and the UN becomes the roadmap on how to reach a democracy based on the principle of majority rule. So when you look at matters that way, you have to understand that these documents were developed in a particular context where there was a contestation and a very deep-seated battle going on. And they charted a path that became a roadmap for what would happen from the ANC perspective at the negotiations which came about post-1990. This book stops at 1990. But what it urges is that people look at the facts and then look how they analyze it and what conclusions they come to. We must do the same for the period 1990 to 1996. So I need to conclude by just referring to the National Party. The documents from the Kobe Kutsia papers and the Bruderborn papers make it very clear that it was determined to find a solution which would preserve white privilege. And it was searching for a formula. And it ended up with a position of trying to protect group rights. It was a formula to protect white privilege. And that position in, in its own ranks bankrupted itself because they could not define groups. If they said Afrikaans is the basis for a group, then the majority of Afrikaans speakers are people of mixed race in South Africa. If they said it was based on 
the, a, a particular homeland, they would, be, they would be unable to define that homeland. If they said it was urban-based, they did not know where to place the urban African because they wanted the urban African to be part of the Bantustan. So the group rights, as at 1990, even in the advanced thinking of the Budobon, they were unable to resolve that question of what constitutes a group. And if you look at, realize that, you then realize that what unfolded at Codesa and the multi-party negotiations was the attempt by the National Party to claw back as much as it could. And that was the battle that took place at the negotiating table. Aside from that, those very important details you've mentioned as well, uh, what the National Party got caught up in doing, uh, because they weren't thinking as internationally, uh, we must remember by that time the ANC had mobilized boycotts against sports, uh, 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 export of food products. South Africa, apartheid South Africa, had become a pariah, and internationally, the ANC had begun to be seen as the a, a non-racial uh, option for South Africa. The Nats themselves were also caught, caught up in their own uh, internal struggle with P.W. Boerta, uh, uh, and as you say, this the Mandela Memorandum being key to, to, to opening this. But what the, the National Party tried to do then was find a rift within the ANC. They, tr they thought that they could uh, find factionalism, they could isolate Mandela from Tambo, not realizing that the two men through the various uh, structures that existed in the ANC were in fact well appraised and talking about this long uh, preparation. For the, You start the book with uh, Goed Steer and you end the book with Goed Steer and in between that, um, tell us a bit about why the, the National Party lost ground. I mean, they were ideologically archaeological in the their vision forward. It wasn't going anywhere, whereas the ANC, with its uh, broad umbrella and uh, acceptance of various viewpoints that are debated and, and discussed, well, at that time among the party, was far better prepared and could see around the political corner, with Mandela as well not wavering uh, one inch uh, while he was being listened to and and driven around, and while well, Neil Barnard came on his own, and, and then Kubi Kutsia came, the, the PW Boerta sent in a whole lot of Trojan horses, so to speak, you know, to see what they could accomplish with Mandela. If both of you could just tell us a bit about uh, Mandela's steadfastness, Tambo's uh, uh, leadership from there, and of course yourselves and everybody else in the middle working towards arriving at that table uh, and cornering them to the point where they were unable to move, because that is exactly what happened. You can talk to us a bit. I know I've thrown a lot at you, but let's begin with them trying to, uh, I suppose, to think, well, it's black people, they must be factions, they must be hating each other, we don't know enough about them, let's let's do it our way. And of course, they came short. Um, if you could just, that's quite an exciting and interesting part of the book as well. You know, the consistent leadership, the consistent discussion, and also the consistent liaison with uh, black consciousness movements, with Steve Biko and other organizations and the PAC uh, as part of a broader vision. That's another thing people don't seem to know, that there was this ongoing consultation. So the Nats are sitting with their own water and, and, and whatever. Um, what was the ideas about Mandela and coming to him? And did they isolate him and talk to him secretly? Because that's what they say they did. Well, uh... I suppose it's inevitable in any political contest that uh, each side tries to maneuver to find the weak spots and the chinks in the other side. Uh, it's clear from uh, the documentation that one has looked at and uh, also from um, yeah, events that uh, the National Party was hoping to find, uh, I suppose, um, elements within uh, the black leadership who would be willing to collaborate with it. Uh, and it was hoping also in the ANC to find uh, the, those amongst the ANC whom uh, it could maybe cut a deal with separately, etc. And uh, it wasn't able to do that. Uh, Mandela and Tambo uh, had been political colleagues since the mid-40s and I think it would have been very, very difficult 
for anyone to uh, drive a wedge between the two of them. Uh, what is remarkable, and uh, uh, many people have commented on this, is that while there was absolutely no communication between Mandela and Tambo uh, when these feelers were sent out by the NP, uh, what they found was that uh, the two men were reading from the same page, so to speak. And uh, that is a result of, uh, you know, long-standing comradeship and principles of the ANC that they had pulled to see for a very long time. Now, uh, when it then came to the actual um, mechanics of going forward, yes, uh, the ANC had seriously thought uh, about uh, issues like what the future constitution would look like. Uh, and we'd also, as we've explained with uh, the Harari Declaration, tried to uh, create a roadmap of the way forward, etc. Now, uh, yeah, in that respect, I suppose, yeah, we did outperform the, the NP. What we must remember is that uh, in the 1980s, uh i suppose a lot of people who in the past had not been willing to countenance the idea of uh, majority rule or uh, an african dominated government uh were bit by bit coming to terms with that you had for instance uh, the pfp then led by Slabbert, finally dropping the notion of a qualified franchise and accepting the notion of universal franchise, but handling it, uh, as they said, uh, to prevent majoritarianism uh, with the notion of uh, consociationism, uh, federations, etc., etc., etc. And they admitted that it was in an attempt to contain what they refer to as what majoritarianism. Uh, you had a group like the IFP, which was also advocating some sort of consociational arrangement, uh, presumably based on homelands. I don't know quite which homelands, etc. But uh, the ANC uh, was the only one insisting on a unitary state uh, and a constitution which would be based on individual human rights rather than on rights defined by a group uh, either ethnically, linguistically, originally defined. Uh, that was the big difference. And with respect to that, again, I think, uh, yeah, we did outperform our opponents. And by 1990, 1989, you'd had, uh, December 1989, you had the Conference for a Democratic Future, which brought together a number of formations uh, inside the country uh, who accepted uh, the constitutional guidelines in principle and also the Harari Declaration. Uh, so that, uh, you know, you had this groundswell uh, in support of the ANC's positions inside the country, and uh, the regime was increasingly politically isolated inside the country as well. One could say that uh, by uh, the time uh, the clerk uh, unbanned the organizations in February and then released Mandela later, uh, politically the NP had been defeated. And uh, which was why it had to come to the negotiating table. Uh, and uh, yeah, the Khrutsky minute, I suppose, uh, yeah, is symbolic of that, uh, of that political defeat. If I may, the questions that you've raised in Paolo's contribution on this matter has provoked certain thinking in my mind. I think when people read the book, they need to also have a, a, a sort of landmark, a series of landmarks. Firstly, when Mandela broaches the idea of negotiations, the idea is not even feasible. But how does it move? How do events move to make it possible? 
And that develops to a point where in time it becomes probable. And by 1989 it becomes inevitable. So when the facts are put together, this is one of the frameworks that people should use to look at it. But I go further and perhaps uh, it may sound oversimplifying, but I think it is in the nature of minority rule that when the struggle is mounted and intensifies, their search for solutions becomes relying on, relies on manipulation. And that's what you see in the conduct of the National Party. Not just within the country, you see it internationally. They were not taking into account that even in the United States, there was a growing force on the ground demanding that the United States government change its position from supporting apartheid to supporting the liberation struggle. So much so that in 85, 86, Reagan vetoed the Triple Comprehensive Act uh, sanctions. But in spite of that veto, the Congress decision prevailed. Now, what did the Nats do? They set up the information scandal. They tried to buy a newspaper in the United States to push their propaganda, to manipulate the lobby system within the Congress. They were not in that frame and incapable of looking at the people on the ground. You see the same, then the opposite side is the African National Congress and the Liberation Movement. Its focus from the beginning had been mobilization of the people. And in the context of that mobilization, it specifically addressed the white community within which, as a beneficiary of the system, it sought to split the forces all the time under the idea of mobilization. That, that brings up an interesting dynamic whenever you look at any struggle anywhere in the world. Where are the people's interests residing and who is relying on mobilizing that force? And what the ANC did was to mobilize the force within the country, but also to mobilize it in the countries that were supporting the apartheid system. So much so, that the book shows the communication from Margaret Thatcher to P.W. Botha during the Commonwealth talks to say she was she fought to prevent further sanctions and that the setting up of the EPG was a compromise. So she was working hand in glove with P.W. Botha, but ignoring the force growing up inside their own countries. So between the net manipulative uh, strategy, uh, tactic and the ANC and Liberation Movement mobilization strategy, we have the recipe for the eventual resolution of the conflict. Well, you see that manipulation throughout the, the National Party's rule in terms of, I mean, Marquis Kosala, the first person who is necklace, was actually, that, that was set up by Joe Mamacella, and they used that moment to frighten people. So, you know, it, it's quite clear in the book from the, you know, your writing perspective that the Nats relied on, uh, you know, when other intellectual thinkers came to them and said, look, like Spansail Flubbert, but as you say, his was a limited vision. Uh, they were too busy and caught up in their sort of fossilized way of wanting to manipulate this process to, in, to ultimately achieve their ends, which was not black majority rule. Um, I just wanted to ask a few questions. We've we only, unfortunately, only got 15 minutes left, but uh, some of our, our, our viewers are asking questions, and I, I do urge you all to get the book. I think it provides a very, very valuable and many missing pieces in the um, in the history of this country, but written from from the victor's side. Actually, usually the victor's write the, the history immediately, but it's taken us some time. Um, uh, Andrew Moriti asks, and we've answered this question, but it is one that keeps getting asked. Is it true that the Freedom Charter was drafted by the Communist Party for the ANC? Well, if you read the book, you'll see it wasn't, but uh, we'll, let the, we'll let the stalwarts answer. <laughs> That's from Andrew Moriti. <laughs> I don't know. If I answer the question, I'll be too angry with it. Maybe Paolo will be more <laughs> Let's leave it. Let's oh. read the book. Paolo, I don't know if you want to tackle that one in limited time. Uh. That's an old, 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 old canard, eh? They were drafted by the Communist Party. No, it was not. Um, 
I was old enough at that time to recognize what was happening around me. And there were mass meetings, small meetings, uh, all sorts of meetings that were held throughout the country, 1954, 1955, leading up to that uh, June meeting at Club Town. And uh, at these meetings, uh, people were, were called upon, what do you want to see as the future of South Africa? What do you like to see in? The and of course, every sort of thing came up, right? I mean, there were, there were meetings, for example, uh, in the, what was called the bachelor's quarters, migrant workers' quarters here in Cape Town. Uh, and many of the people there, uh, Tallow's frozen. What? I don't know if you want to up there, Matt. While he's frozen, let me just say, read the Freedom Charter and ask yourself, section by section, whose interests are being articulated and catered for in that document. And you will find the interests of the working people, the interests of the poor, the interests of the oppressed, and the interests also of those who belong to the oppressor community find a place. It is a document that tries to pull all the former social structures in our country to say you have a common interest in having a South Africa which belongs to all who live in it. And that is a path to prosperity, peace and friendship for all who live within these boundaries. Now. The idea that it is a, 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 a document cooked up by communists is actually an insult to the intelligence of the South African people. And, I, I, and as I said, I want to control my, my language, uh, <laughs> but that is where I am on the Freedom Charter. And I think that yes. people should be looking at our history by at least granting us the oppressed who were the majority in this country, the people of color, the at courtesy of saying that we could think for ourselves. The idea that somebody else is thinking for us is part of that colonial mindset which says that people of color can't even think for themselves. And I find that a huge insult, not to me, but to our people. Indeed. And I think, you know, I recommend again that people read the book. There are, there's detailed annexes at the back. You can read the letters. You can, you can piece the piece together, uh, all of the pieces together yourself. We've lost Paolo for a moment, but I'm sure he'll be back. There's a question here, uh, which again, also about John Macisa, which, Macisa, which is an interesting one. Um, was the ANC ready to govern? Uh, and then he adds, given the situation we are in now as a country. So I don't know. That's a double, <laughs> double sided. Uh, was the ANC ready to govern? That's a question that arises because by, let us be fair to ourselves. I ask the question, when did negotiations become probable? And I would say 1988. But we were in such a situation that after 30 years of being illegal, we had to conduct the negotiations establish the organization within the country from ground level and at the same time prepare for the outcome of the elections which would be uh, of the negotiations which would be an election and that had to be condensed within four years we did try to make an effort we had a conference which prepared a document ready to govern but i must say that the number of people that we sent for training to prepare them for the transition was infinitely small compared to the task that faced us. And so, yes, there is never a moment when the oppressed can say we are not ready to govern, but there is the issue of how much opportunity you have to prepare yourself in the light of the circumstances where Bantu education was designed, in the words of Fervurt, to keep us in the position of hewers of wood and throwers of water. My generation 
if they thought of a future, could only dream of becoming teachers, lawyers, or doctors. 1994 makes me so proud when I see people at various places in ordinary life today. And I see an, a, an African woman is a pilot. I see a, an Indian woman is an aviation guide. I see people as astronomers. I think 1994 made it possible for us to dream again. And with dreams, there's a huge chasm in delivery. Of course, but I think Ivor Chipkin also mentions the, you know, the, the great, great task the ANC had of a bankrupt treasury. You've got these homelands you've got to bring together with uh, Bantustan police and civil service. And that's a different story. If you're asking if the ANC was ready to govern, uh, you need to go and read what the ANC inherited when it did start to govern. Anthony Heard is asked a question. And of course, he's mentioned in your book. I was a journalist at the Cape Times at the time. He interviewed Oliver Tambor, did his first uh, published interview in South Africa. And Anthony Heard asks the question that we've got a few, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, I mean, I could have spoken to speak to the both of you for much, much longer. What do you see as the other major factors behind the ANC's victory, apart from its own efforts? Uh, I suppose perhaps um, I suppose the banks calling in the loans as well after the West. No, uh, I would go much. I would go much further. I would go much further than the banks. First of all, we have to take into account that it was the mobilis the people themselves, who rose up in revolt, and they could not be crushed and they rose up in the middle of a state of emergency. The second thing is that the international community came out on our side. They are the ones that pushed the forces in the Western countries to now impose sanctions on South Africa. And if you look at the shock that ran through the system, we recount the incident where uh, Duplessis, uh, Baron Duplessis phones but both are to say, by the way, there's going to be these sanctions by yes. the United States. Yes. What can you do to stop it? I think yes. the, the reaction tells you what a shock it was to that system. So the role of the banks was as a result of the pressure. Remember in the United States, there was the disinvestment campaign going on where pension funds were being withdrawn. So the banks were pushed into reacting. Left on their own, they would not have come on the side of liberation. They are just interested in their profits and they need to be pushed to act in the interest of the country as a whole. Yeah, I think so that, it that, is that, the uh, arms struggle, yes. it is the arms struggle, it is the mass struggle, it is the underground, it is the international campaign to isolate South Africa and all of these act forces acting together, reinforcing each other, propel the country into a situation well, there was no other option for the Nets but to come to the table. Uh, and that's very clear in the book as well. I mean, and, and that is undisputed that by the time they got to the table, they were on their knees and, and uh, attempted in a way to find a way through this. And, and, and I, we don't have time to talk about the difference between Boerta and de Klerk. Uh, Neil Barnard doesn't have much respect for de Klerk uh, in his books. And it's quite interesting, I mean, they, if, uh, your perceptions on de Klerk taking over this process from Boerta, uh, you know, it's like these brooders twisting with each other, wasting our time. Um, there are people asking us our view on, views on the current president and his factionalism. I don't think we can touch on that now. That's not what you're here for. Last question from Andrew Murifi again. He says, can you please ask Mr. McMaharaj and Mr. Pallet Jordan why now the ANC talk about the land issue? ANC was opposing PAC on land issues. Um, uh, you know, once again, I'm not sure if that's correct. And, that, uh, and indeed, if you want to speak to that one, it's we're ending on the land issue. Um, is that true? Is that not true? Uh, I doubt it. The question again, why does the ANC only talk about the land issue now, which is not the case? I, I don't think that question is correctly formulated, because if you look at the interim constitution that was negotiated at the multi-party talks, in 1993, November, you will see the clause there, firstly talking about the need to redress the injustices of the past, secondly talking about the issue of land, and it does not speak 
uh, to the idea of willing buyer, willing seller. It provides for the confiscation of land without compensation, and, but it provides for a more elaborate process so that in keeping with the demand of the Freedom Charter, the redistribution of land should be focused also in ensuring that there is a, it is used for production, uh, productive activity, in particular agricultural products. That position stands and the final constitution adopted in 1996 uh, by the Constitutional Assembly elected 400 delegates and the 90 from the Senate. They too adopted that clause on the land. So the land issue has been there. It has been in our constitution and it was provided for on the basis that it should be redistributed. And that position, by the way, was a position taken by the ANC because if you look at the documents again and the facts, you will find then the CODESA documents and right now I've put out word to find out where are all the documents. I know some of them are the National Archives, but people must look at the facts before they come to a conclusion. And I think this book provides a lot of that for young people who might not have had access to these facts before. Uh, just before we close off, uh, Darkly Africa says there was so growing sentiment uh, that those with, uh, who are part of the MDM and their role in the struggle has been underplayed at worst. What are your views, uh, Palo and, and Mac, on the fact that the role of the MDM has been underplayed in general? Not in your, in your uh, book at all, because uh, Darkly Africa, you'll see that uh, there's extensive communication with the MDM and contact and uh, deliberations. Um, do you think the role has been underplayed of the mass democratic movement inside the country? Well, well that's not my perception. Uh, I'm sure there are people who might feel that way. But if you look at the literature that's been produced thus far uh, about that period, a lot of it deals with the mass democratic movement. Uh, in our particular work, we have tried to underscore the importance of uh, the mass democratic movement and mass mobilization inside the country as a key uh, to you know, victory and to success in the struggle. Uh, I don't think it's correct to say it's been underplayed. Some people might feel that uh, it's not given as high a profile as perhaps it needs to be, but it's not my perception. I don't know. Matt might have a different view. But when I look at bookshelves in the bookshops, uh, there are lots of titles dealing with the MDM. There is, there is a tendency to, to see the struggle in silos. What we need to appreciate is, although we have talked about the four pillars, they are part of one process. Those separation and silos were forced on us because of being made, the struggle being illegalized. So when we look at the problem, we must look at it as these pillars interacting with each other. And the place and given to the mass struggles cannot be minimized. Because right from the beginning, the decision even in 1961 to turn to the armed struggle the decision of the national executive of the ANC was to retain the ANC even though it was banned in order to do the political mobilization on the ground. And it gave authority to Mandela and others to in the meantime set up and gone to Wasiswa. So the idea that even the armed struggle was totally linked to the mass struggle was right there from the beginning. There will be at times where people will put the emphasis on one or the other. And again, I would urge people to look at the facts and read an essay by Walter Sisulu, who talks about the different forms of struggle. And he wrote this in prison. And he talked about how these different forms, be, one dominates the time uh, at one time and another dominates the other. What made the transition in South Africa possible was the up sustained uprisings that began in 1983. We must not minimize that. But what we try to do in this book is put the facts of the interaction without claiming that it's the ANC that takes sole credit for what happened at the mass level. We recognize that it was a force that developed within the country in the midst of repression. With that concept, I think 
interrogate the book. I would urge people, look at the facts, then join the dots as Praveen Gordon would ask you to do, but don't start joining dots based on assumptions and speculation. Join the dots based We've on come, facts. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we really have come to the end of an hour and I really haven't uh, touched on so much in this book. I'd urge you all, you can get it from the Daily Maverick Bookshop. It's lovely to have both Palo and Mac back uh, uh, in our in our midst, you've been hiding away doing your work. Thank you very much for this great book. I mean, it's it, it enlightened me and pulled together threads of thoughts that need to be pulled together in South Africa. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more debate and discussion, and you're going to face lots of questions. But thank you for writing it. Thank you for making your time. Uh, thank you for speaking to me from Orania. Um, I'll fill you in on how this works later on. Uh, do keep safe and well, and thank you for everything you've done uh, for us. And uh, I urge people to get the book and watch this uh, webinar. We'll be putting it up later. Thank you very much to all of you for attending. Um, and goodbye, everyone. Let's uh, let's just keep on. Re get the book, and then you can have discussions with your friends about what's what. Thank you very much, both of you, for, for your contribution and for the book as well. And, and, and take care. Um, we'll speak to you again soon, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.